There's a saying that says that a word to the wise is sufficient. James addresses that in chapter 3 when he says, Who is wise in understanding among you? You know, wisdom is something like faith. Faith is to believe what wisdom is to knowledge. Belief is the acceptance of certain principles and facts. Faith is a utilization of that belief for your own good. Knowledge is the certain of certain facts and understanding of certain facts and, and principles. Wisdom is the insight to use those facts in the right way. Solomon, when he was praying to God, did not ask for knowledge. In 1 Kings 3, starting at verse 9, he says this, Give thy servant therefore an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge? And the speech pleased the Lord, and God said unto him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked for yourself, long life, or riches, or life of your enemies, but has but asked yourself understanding to discern justice, therefore I have done according to your word. I have given you a wise and an understanding heart. Solomon was considered to be the wisest of all men because his wisdom came from God. James says that everything, everyone who is, everything that is good, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Perfect God, perfect wisdom comes from above. Unfortunately, most of the world today does not rely on God's wisdom, but on human wisdom. And James also adjust, uh, addresses that as well. For he states that all human wisdom is imperfect. And it, is, and, and it has come from natural sources. It is from Satan. This goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. If you look in chapter 3 of Genesis, when Satan was tempting Eve, he said these things. Did not God say that you can eat of any tree in the garden? And Eve, Eve saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and desirable to make men wise. If you look at most of human nature, that is what it is involved with. People seem to think that everything in the garden is theirs. If it looks good, it must be good. If it tastes good, it must be good for you. And it must be pleasant and desirable if it's going to make you worldly wise. We have a, there's a saying in medicine, though it's somewhat tongue in cheek, that if it tastes good, it's no good for you. <laughs> and that's not too far from the truth in many cases. You know, natural wisdom is what the world works with. And you can see the mess the world is in. Yes. And it goes in those four principles that everything belongs to everyone, that if it's good, if it looks good, you want it. If it tastes good, it must be good for you. And therefore, and, and if it may, seems to make you wise, then it's desirable. <coughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. And many people, for instance, get addicted to drugs because it seems when they first start to be good. It doesn't last that way. Many people get into trouble because they think that everything is theirs and they can do with it as they want. This is the wisdom of the world. 
There was a girl named Crystal who was abused dramatically when she was younger. She went on to eventually become a teacher, but her whole life was, a, was affected by the way she had been abused in her younger years. She became addicted to alcohol and to drugs, and in spite of being a teacher, continued on that path afraid that somebody sometime would find out what her past had been. And she says this, I struggled because I'm the least likely person to be telling anyone about God. Put simply, I'm not ever going to be on the short list for sainthood. In my life, I was a sinner, and I'm pretty sure I broke every one of the Ten Commandments. I was a skeptic. I'd grown up in the heart of the Bible Belt, been baptized not once but four times, gone to church regularly, heard a million sermons about God, yet deep in my heart I wasn't convinced. Over and over I challenged God to prove He existed, and every time He did, I'd set up a new roadblock, a new challenge for Him to overcome. I saw the hardships in my life as evidence that God had no interest in protecting me from harm. I questioned him and I cursed him. And at times, I, I wanted to cut him out of my life. That's not an untypical story for many people who've been abused in their childhood. They've been abused because they think that God has abandoned them. This girl had an acute case of pancreatitis and died. She was clinically dead, but she was resuscitated. And this is what happened, part of what happened when she was dead. Unlike on earth, where I was plagued by doubts and fears, in heaven there was nothing but absolute certainty about what I was. This was a far more complete representation of my spirit and my heart and my being than was ever possible on earth. A far deeper self-awareness than the selfishness of hopes and fears and dreams and scars that defined me during my life. I was flooded with self-knowledge and all the junk that's cluttered my identity on earth, instantly fell away, revealing for the first time ever the real me. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew, I knew you, and now I knew myself. Imagine that. The first person we meet in heaven is ourselves. First Corinthians says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. Yes. Goes along with the Bible pretty well, doesn't it? Yes. Thank you, Jesus. George Ritchie also had an out of, out of body experience when he died. <coughs> after severe illness. This is one of the most documented near-death experiences ever. Because when he was dead, he actually traveled spiritually 500 and some miles from where he was. And what he saw, what he experienced, what he witnessed has been collaborated by witnesses who were in that area at the time. He has since gone on to be a doctor, a psychiatrist, head of a department of psychiatry in a college, and he was one of the founders, because of his experience, he was one of the founders of the Peace Corps in the U.S. He had another broad experience as well. 
And one of the biggest questions that was there, that he asked and was asked, was this. What have you done with your life to show me? Okay. I understood that my first frantic efforts to come up with an, an, an impressive answer, I had missed the point altogether. God was not asking about accomplishments and awards. This question, like everything else proceeding from him, had to do with love. How much have you loved with your life? Have you loved others as I am loving you? Totally and unconditionally. Isaiah says, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Isaiah 43, 6-7. These people, there are over a hundred thousand documented near-death experiences like this. If you have doubts about what's happening after you die, read some of them. Yes. They're not put out by quacks and by people who want just attention. Mm -hmm. These are people who are professionals, professors, doctors, <coughs> Harvard University graduates, presidents of banks. These are people who really are affected by what they've seen and what has happened to them. And what they, has, what they have seen correlates very well with what the Bible teaches us. Because all through the Bible are explanations of what heaven is like, although we may not recognize it as such when we first read it. Who is wise and understanding among us? True wisdom, true wisdom comes from God, not from man. And that, this time of year especially, is something we should be thinking about. <coughs>